Amorphous Solar and Young Rovers at Overland Expo 2013. This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Well, welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen. This is your weekly dose of technos, and we have a fantastic show for you this week because here I am in Flagstaff, Arizona at the Overland Expo. And we're going to be checking out the latest in outdoor tech and really just those who experience life in such a free and visceral way that uh, they just value true freedom above all others. And I really... I find something really beautiful about that. So I want to share it with you guys. So uh, that's what's coming up on this episode of Hack 5. difference with the technology of power film versus some of the other stuff that I see out there. Okay, well we use amorphous silicon as our base technology and that differs from the other stuff that you see out there in terms of uh, its form and function. Uh, the other solar technologies consist of glass panels which is crystalline technology. It could be either mono or polycrystalline. Um, ours is thin film based so it's very thin, it's very flexible, very durable and uh, what that gives you is, is a portability factor that you may not have with a glass panel. Um, we have great advantages in terms of weight, the durability, durability that I mentioned, uh, flexibility, and uh, footprint. Okay, so you, you mentioned footprint, uh, but I, from what I understand about the differences in technology is the amorphous, uh, while flexible, uh, doesn't have the same kind of efficiency that you'd expect from a poly or mono crystalline cell. Is that mm -hmm. the case? That is true. That is true, and efficiency um, is a measurement at a point in time mm -hmm. uh, under perfect conditions. And uh, what we design our technology, with our technology, what we designed to do is um, make solar panels that um, are optimized for the real world conditions. So while our efficiency may only be five to six percent, which is what amorphous is, uh, versus the 14 to 20 percent of glass panels, uh, the advantage that we have uh, in terms of low light performance and shadow tolerance actually allows us to make a panel that produces more pa more power over the course of a day than a panel that may be more efficient than ours. So how would you compare, like uh, as far as you know, being able to un under the same conditions soak up you know more power uh, mm -hmm. than a traditional cell? Is it that you're using a uh, bigger footprint or you know more cells or, or what? It's because our charging window is longer. And what that means is that our panel will start to produce power the minute the sun starts to hit it during the course of the day and produce all day long, so even even till sunset. And so because I have such a large window, whereas our competing technologies are only maybe taking a portion of that uh, charging window to, to charge um, at maximum efficiency, uh, allows us to make more power during the day. So is the amorphous cells, uh, are they dependent on the angle to the sun, or can you just lay this flat on the ground, or how does that factor in? Um, well, it, it, all solar technologies um, are optimized when they're angled to the sun. Um, with amorphous, it's less critical, which means you can take it out and just lay it flat on the ground, and you're going to get the type of performance that you expect from it. Now, some people would say that while it's flexible, you've got the problems with, like, say, solder joints and stuff like that, where if something snaps, suddenly you you know you lose a panel, you lose a section of a panel. Uh, how does the solar, uh, the power film stuff account for that? Well, what we do is we've, we've um, got a pri proprietary interconnect process, which, which allows us to make panels that have uh, multiple different points of contact within the, within the panel. And that allows us to um, survive, and I'm going to point to this over here, to survive point damage. Wow. And what that like means... somebody had fun with the 22 or something. Yeah, actually, 38, but close. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, what, what that allows us to do is with, when a panel um, is somehow compromised, 
uh, whether it be point damage or crack or something along those lines. Obviously, we don't have the cracking issue because we don't use glass, uh, but this allows the, the power to flow around that area that's been affected and still produce. So even with these holes in it, this, pa this panel lost less than 10% of its ability to generate power. So a panel this size, what kind of power output should I expect from it? Obviously, you know, voltage and amperage wise. This, this panel is a seven watt panel at 15.4 volts. Okay, so, so from an amperage standpoint, you're looking at uh, about a half a watt an hour. Okay. Or, I'm sorry, half an amp an hour. Half an amp an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what does it take to get, you know, a 200 watt panel? Um, well, it, it requires us to just put more solar into uh, the construction of the panel. And what you're looking at is in the back of our booth here, um, deployed there is 190 watts of power. And what that provides is roughly 12 amps per hour. And what's the footprint of that? It's 96 inches by 114 inches. And is that the largest uh, in your product line? It, it is the, uh, in what we would call man portable. We do actually make a power shade that requires uh, vehicle transportation and, and usually a, a lot of muscle to get it on and off of a truck. Um, and that's uh, a shade that has uh, supports and everything and it, and it um, um, is one kilowatt. We make them in one kilowatt sections and you can tie up the three of those together. So in the field, if you needed uh, a, a large amount of power, uh, in this case, the military is the, the primary user of that and they, uh, they will tie two of those together most often and then they'll, they'll put their commu communications tents or forward operating bases underneath the power shade and uh, generate the power they need for that tent. So you're talking about just like we have here, this, this awning, your tent here, you're talking about just wrapping it in one of those guys? Absolutely. That's cool. So what are some of the other uh, products that I'm seeing here? This is a uh, small portable USB charger. Mm -hmm. Is the battery and integrated? Battery integrated. Oh, so just two, uh, two AA batteries? Two AA batteries. I love these envelope guys. Those are great. Yeah, great battery. And those, those batteries actually drive the USB port. And when you've used up the power from those batteries, this solar will recharge those batteries in four hours or less. Four hours, for real? Yeah. That's not bad. There you go. And this folds up to anything. Like, how much can you actually uh, wrap that up without before you're damaging the, the panels? It won't. It won't damage the panels at all. Really? This is, uh, that's fantastic. The only thing that damages panels is a crease. Oh, I see. Uh, and a crease causes uh, catastrophic microfracturing across the panel. So is that why, for instance, there's all of these gaps here between so that you can fold Those are it your properly? fold points, yes. Yeah. And then we use Litz wire to connect all the panels together. What wire? Litz wire. What's Litz wire? Litz wire is a bunch of tiny wires uh, grouped together uh, to allow for flexibility within that wire. Cool. And uh, what this unit is right here, and this was a specialty unit that we built for uh, NASCAR teams. Um, so that they could have access to electrical power in the pits where uh, there's some regulations on AC unit usage. Uh, so they're using uh, solar power, DC usage, uh, to charge from this. They're putting a, uh, this has an, a, a lithium ion battery in it, 18 amp hours. And then they access the power through all these 12 volt ports. Um, on the more commercial side, what we've designed is, is um, very similar to that. This, this utilizing sealed lead acid batteries and an inverter. So it gives you a couple of different options. You can uh, put up to uh, 60 watts of solar in and that will charge the internal battery which then runs this inverter or you can access the power through this 12 volt DC um, port. Very cool. Well thank you so much. I really appreciate it Chad. You're welcome. I'm Darren Kitchen at Overland Expo 2013 with Shane and Sandra Young. How are you guys? Good, good, real good. Beautiful time of year to be here. It's absolutely lovely. Okay, so I need to know what, what is the story, how long you've been doing this, and what on earth enabled you to be able to do this? I've always had a love affair with Land Rover, and uh, I own a Land Rover repair shop in Fort Lauderdale, and it allowed me the luxury of being able to put this little vehicle together. It's originally a 1989 Camel Trophy truck. Uh, competed in the Amazon Trophy Series, so we've kitted it out with trying to stay as original as possible, 
yet still make it so that it's comfortable for us to live in and still be able to go anywhere that we choose to go. And so how long have you guys uh, been going anywhere you choose to go? Well, we just started this round in the beginning of December. We had a fantastic time with a bunch of other Land Rover enthusiasts down in Mexico and then back here in the southwest U.S. And this is just the beginning of our trek on up to Alaska, across Canada, and to all points east, south, north, and west. <laughs> so how long do you expect, you know, expect to go for, and, and, or, is it, or is that even an equation in the trip? So if we don't have a set itinerary, we'll basically drive until the money runs out and worry about how we'll drive any further then. Uh, we plan on it taking two or three years to um, do what we need to do and then we'll go from here, as Sandra said, up into Alaska and then across Canada, ship into Europe, we'll do Europe and as much of that as we can up into Russia, maybe even Siberia, then we'll head down south into Africa, down into South Africa, then we'll ship down to Australia, to the west coast, and we'll drive across Australia and settle back for a short while at least in the east side of Australia, in Sydney basically. And then so what uh, what have you done to prepare for this kind of a trip and you know what does it take to, to do such a thing? Well, my bags have been packed since I was a little kid to be on the road. Getting rid of everything that we owned wasn't too difficult because we're not all that material. It was basically trying to get this, what you see behind you, to be our house for the next three years. Everything that we need is basically on these four wheels. So. What has been the biggest difficulty in getting this to be your home? Uh, there's some weather concerns where we basically like to travel real back country where there aren't a lot of people and a lot of luxuries and we're doing it if it's 12 degrees or 112 degrees. So we're basically trying to get kitted for all scenarios, stay warm, stay dry, stay well fed, <laughs> keep things cold when we need to. So making that as mobile as possible has been the challenge and he's fantastic at fabricating his own things and working things out so uh, basically everything you see behind you is homemade. And so you're talking about all of these different countries, all of these places all over the globe that you want to go to and talking about year round. Uh, how would you define what living the dream or doing it is? Exactly what we're doing, just no itinerary. We see somewhere that we want to go, we'll head off that way, we'll chat to somebody on the road and they'll suggest somewhere else that is really neat, off the grid completely and we'll head off there and just continue on one day at a time basically. And so are you sharing this adventure with the world in any, any, any way? We try to maintain a website as best we can. Uh, we are usually enough off the grid that we don't get Wi-Fi a lot, but uh, yes, we have, we have lots of friends and family that are traveling with us vicariously. And is there anything that you miss when you do leave, you know, mainstream society? No, <laughs> not at all. No, really don't. The, the more, it takes a while to get to the point where you don't miss any of the stuff that you've become accustomed to, but once it's, it's very liberating to be able to just leave quote unquote society and just get out into the middle of nowhere, it, it's absolutely lovely. All right, and where can they follow the adventure? We're on youngrovers.com and we also, under Young Rovers on Facebook, we post there frequently, quite easily. All right, thank you so much, guys. A real pleasure. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you. Good luck with your journey. And you too. I want to take a quick moment to thank the fine folks over at Domain.com for directly supporting Back Across America here. Um, and you guys have heard me tell you guys, if what you want to do is get a, uh, an idea off the ground, you're going to need a great domain. And let me tell you, Domain.com has the hookup. What you want is a .NET. I mean, if you already have a .com, it's the perfect companion to it. But a lot of times that .com you might want, it's already taken, you might have to register something ridiculous and characters, you want to do that. But with .NET, it's a great alternative. It allows you to go ahead and uh, you know get your website up off the ground. And the .NET is the third most popular top level domain in the world. It's just right behind .com and .de. It was one of the original, well the original six, it wasn't supposed to be, and fun story about the RFCs there. But uh, anyway, you can get your 
yourself a .NET right now over at Domain.com for $8.99. But here's the thing. Not only are they supporting Hack5, Hack Across America directly, they're supporting you guys with an awesome hookup. It's called 15% off their already affordable domain names and hosting. All you have to do is use the coupon code HAK5. So when you've got a great idea, think Domain.com. Last week's trivia question was, what is the maximum length of an SSID? And the answer is 32 characters. Number three, number two. Now this week's question is, which wireless mode connects machines directly to one another without the use of an access point? You can answer that over to hack5.org trivia for your chance to win some awesome Hack 5 goodies.